I like the land myself, Mama said. I like seeing where I stand. Would you care for some pie? I kept staring at the lid. What I saw, the blur of blue into white, wasn't beautiful, but I could imagine it turning beautiful. I probably looked like a pure fool, staring at a pot lid as if it was a magazine picture, but the minister had given me something that I didn't understand. There was nothing of Kansas in that blue line. After May's dried apple pie, Reverend Farley put down his fork and announced, now that was cause for Thanksgiving, the first churchy thing he'd said since giving the blessing. I put on a pleasant expression, planning to think about oceans while he talked about salvation. Pa looked sour. But Reverend Farley kept unsettling us. He reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a harmonica. The first song he played was Amazing Grace, which we none of us sang well. And after that, he started on a tune I'd never heard, Sweet and slow, it had a clean ache, and I studied the tablecloth so no one would be able to see my wet eyes. Mama joined in, her low voice true. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. Look away, you roll the river. She sang only when she felt moved. Sometimes years would pass. But when she opened her mouth, we all hushed. Suddenly the air was rich, and so it became poor when she stopped. That's no church song, Pa said when the last note was still hovering. It can be, Reverend Farley said. How? Pa said. It's about having to go away. It's not what you want to do, but it's what you have to do. I said, why does somebody have to go away? Me? I heard a call, Reverend Farley said. What about somebody who's not a reverend, I said. Nell, Mama said. What does a call sound like, I said, heedless as a chick. It wasn't Mama who would hurt me. She could barely lift her hand to beat biscuits. Reverend Farley said, Two Episcopalian ministers arrive at the same church with the congregation there waiting. It's a big church. Folks are well-dressed. There are fine carriages outside. The first one says to the other people in church, I heard a call. I don't know I that what those fellow here doing. I heard a call too, says the second preacher. What did yours say? Lo, I will make you a leader of nations. What did yours say? No one ever lost money on hog futures. Preach on, cried the congregation. Pa snorted. Myself, I'd never seen a pup, an Episcopalian. I said, I don't think anybody gets called to Kansas for money. Nobody's got any. Reverend Farley said to Pa, she's the spit of you, isn't she? Her bad luck, Pa said. <clears throat> Reverend Farley stayed in town for a week, but we didn't go to hear him preach past the first day when everyone went. I didn't want to see any more of the man. He left me feeling rumpled, and even if I wasn't fool enough to repeat the experiment with the pot lid, I couldn't forget the glimpse he had given me of a view that was light and rested on a color I'd never seen in nature. After he came, I couldn't keep a mind to things. Even the chores I normally liked, watering the chickens, chopping back the galloping weeds, didn't keep my attention. And I made careless mistakes, spilling kerosene and leaving the lamp out overnight, the kinds of mistakes my sisters made. Me, the sharpest of Pa's girls. I dawdled and sighed and drifted, thinking shapeless white and blue thoughts, and later when Mama asked where the, ho where the eggs were, I couldn't tell her. I was unsettled, as nervy as a horse when a big storm is coming in. The horizon remained placid, without new wind or the purple blur of thunderheads, but that steadiness was no comfort. Something had twisted me and burrowed down, and now I scratched and twisted, miserable in my skin. Pa could see my distraction. I was never able to hide anything from the man if he wanted to look, and ever since the dinner with Reverend Farley, he kept me close to hand. The Tuesday after the Reverend's visit, he took me out to the barn. Doing chores with him meant I didn't have to make dinner, but it also meant Pa had something he wanted to say, so it was hard to know whether I felt freed or trapped. Did you call me out here because you're wanting a piece of meat tonight that's cooked all the way through, I said. You're a stubborn thing. He handed me the flat tin of barn salve that we used on all the cow's cuts and wounds. The salve had been white once, but it had aged to a thick yellow and smelled like bad cooking fat laced with kerosene. The barn stank whenever we opened the tin, and this summer we had to open it a lot. Both our cows were eaten up by biting flies, their rumps pink with weeping, crusted sores. The cows could hardly stand to be touched, even to be milked, and their lowing was full of long misery. They, will, they were normally sweet-tempered animals, but in a minute one of them would try to nip us while we kept dabbing on the sticky ointment. Pa said, you could make things easy, but you won't do it. What's easy? The smell of the greasy salve stuck to me. The cow twitched her flat rump and huffed irritably. Girls half your age can manage to make a loaf of bread that doesn't come up gummy in the middle. It's a knack. I haven't got it. I think we can all see that much. He reached across the cow's back to flick a bit of salve from my face. Girl, what do you want? If he'd looked mean or angry, I would have known what to say, but his face was stony. 
Mostly, I was aware of the rich, sweet smell of the cows, the tang of manure, and the acrid medicine that was smeared halfway up to my elbows now. I like to sew, I said. I went to town last week. Jack Platt asked after you. His daddy's spread is bigger than this one. Everybody's spread was bigger than ours. Pa knew that I knew that. My hand shook a little when I said, what did you tell him? I told him you were tolerable. You don't help a girl much, do you? I don't see as that's my job. Jack Platt's daddy's 300 acres spilled between us. The Platts had a house with a window, and it occurred to me that it would be a fine thing to look outside of a house during the daylight. Pa said, what should I have told him, Nell? That you spent half an evening looking at a pot lid as if it could tell you something? No, don't tell him that. Jack will come to see you if I don't stop him. That's what people do, I think. They come to see each other. I'm only going to ask you this once. Is Jack what you want? He let me take my time. Jack was a new thought. Marriage was a new thought, though it shouldn't have been. Just last month, the Reverend read out Nassine and Ernold's bands while Nassine sat like the Queen of Sheba in the front row, thinking on babies, Ernold's wood frame house, and a new ringer washer. She wasn't but a month older than me. Unbidden images tumbled through my head. Berlinda and Mal Marlon Mallory ran off to Hutchinson to get married, and for months after they came back, Berlinda told about the hotel there and the wide streets. No one has called on May yet, I said unsteadily. There's no law. It wouldn't be easy here, just her and Viola. May was already 17, but little Vi was only nine and not handy. We'll manage. Listen up now. If you don't want Jack, I'll tell him. Mrs. Jack Platt. Jack was shorter than me, with bandy legs and hair so curly that we used to say ba to him in school. He had stopped school at 12 rather than boarding in Hayes for high school, but I saw the Platts at church and in town. A person had to put his mind to it to disappear in Mercer County. Like everyone, I knew that Jack's mother was a tyrant, his father a quiet man who stayed out of his wife's way. Even at church, Oris Platt could find a way to stay on the other side of the building from her, a skill we all admired. Jack favored his mother, and I wondered whether that should worry me. His lamb-like curls were hers, and his strut, and his quick cutting words when he was exercised. But he had spent one of the bed out in a flower flat on his belly under an outhouse, coaxing two kittens to come to him. He must have washed them, because when he brought them home in a basket, they were fluffy as kittens on a greeting card, and he talked his mother into keeping them. I hadn't seen any of this, but everybody knew the story. I would learn different stories, other ones, if I lived in the Platt place. He's nice enough, I said. I won't stop you, Pa said. I just want you to think. What's to think about? Once you decide, you've decided. You can't come up for air later and say, God, that was a mistake. So think. Is this what you want out of your future? The future's a hard thing to see. I presume that Pa was thinking about me squinting across the top of the pot lid. I could still see that wavery line, full of possibility. You better can, he said. Did you, when you courted Mama? The rough bristles of the cow's tail whipped me under the ear. That'll be a welt, Pa said. He spread more salve, working the clear ointment down into the little craters that oozed with their own clear juice. Your mother is a good woman. I couldn't ask for a better one. She knows how to stretch a nickel, and she doesn't hanker after what she can't have. He wasn't saying anything but the truth. Pa and I were the hankerers. She's never raised her voice to, to me, even when she ought should have, he said. When I called on her, folks said she was sweet as a honey cake. I went back to the of sore I'd already dabbed. Pa wasn't much on sweets, even May's good pies. What I'm about to say is not a complaint, you hear me? I esteem your mother. I won't hold with anything else. Now that Pa had stopped touching her backside, Dixie was placid, munching the oats he put out for her. It's a fine thing to share your days with a person. That's what a marriage is, sharing. You share a home and a place. You share children. But your mother and I don't see the world alike. When I look over the fields, I see fences that need fixing, the place where the seed washed out. She doesn't see those things. I know that, I said. I'm trying to tell you something. What do you know about Jack? Same as you. Their place will support another mouth and his mother's a pistol. Not much, he said. Where else am I going to go? You're still a youngster. Wait for a feller who you know you like. Guess I'll be waiting for Reverend Farley to come back. Guess you won't either. Man who lives riding circuit isn't looking for a wife to support, and his jokes were no good. Then I guess I'd better let Jack Platt come to call, since I'm not interested in being a spinster lady. 
As if it had been waiting for just this moment, my mind produced a list of Mercer County bachelors. Sam Wynn, whose last wife had died in childbirth at age 20 and who held girls too tight at dances. Karth Noller, who lived in town and ran the post office along with the funeral home. The scattering of ranchers who came in for fee looked and worked over rural the size they used for livestock. In that company, Jack looked fine. There's no call to rush, he said. You're still half a child. This was the first time Pa had indicated I was anything but all a child, and hearing him say so brought feeling up in me, something hard, screwed tight. Everyone in Mercer County knew his pride in me, his middle girl, no bigger than a minute but still a fire pop. At every funeral or covered supper, people recalled the time a man from the bank came to see Pa. I wasn't much out of diapers and didn't know what they were talking about, but I could see Pa sitting at the edge of the bench like a shamed schoolboy. So I crept up behind the man and bit him on the leg. The man yanked away from me and Pa whooped, saying he'd meant to warn the man about the Feist dog. For a long time after that, he called me Feist when he was feeling good, though he'd let that drop away lately. The cow ointment stung my eyes. I said, I'm not after staying on the smallest ranch in Kansas. I'd like to see something fresh for a change. He put on a grin I'd never seen before. It looked bashful, and it made the feeling in me tighten even more, like a jar lid twisted till it breaks. He said, it's not enough for you to see your old pa? That's the first thing I want to stop seeing, I said, hating the words the second they flew from my mouth. They were not what I meant to say. There were no words for what I meant to say. Pa's face slammed shut. He pitched the open tin of cow ointment at me. Its top side stuck itself square against my nose and eyes, and for a panicky second, all I could breathe was old, sticky fat and kerosene. Next week, Pa was saying as I shook the tin off, tomorrow, I won't have your mother living with a child who doesn't know respect. Is there a rag? I said. The ointment was all over my face and spattered onto my neck and shoulders. I was struggling not to gag. The dress was done for. He threw a feed sack at me so hard the tie strings whipped my ear. Mouth on you like an outhouse. No gratitude. I rubbed the burlap over my face, scraping the clots of ointment that we would need again back into the tin. I'm guessing Horace Platt doesn't throw cow medicine at anybody. I wouldn't bet against his wife's throwing arm, though. Looks like you'll be finding out. You can write a letter and tell us all. Are you going to lock me out of the house tonight? I should. But you'll have a home here as long as you want it. And you don't want it. I stood wiping myself clean until Pa left the barn, the cow making contented grunts. There didn't seem anything wrong with Jack. I was 15 years old. Thank you. <laughs>